Welcome back to the Cruise Elite Podcast. I've got a surprise for you guys. He's on the other end here. His name is Tony. He's my podcast producer. Over the last few months, Tony's been helping me figure out some great ideas for this podcast and getting started. And today, he's here on the show with me, and I'm excited to have him here. How you doing, Tony? Hey, Taylor. So good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing very well. Any news with Cruise Elite? I think you guys just did a membership drive. Yeah, lots of news with uh, Cruise Elite. So we've been spending the last month going through a sales process and a prep process for one of the programs that we run called the Neuro Dojo. Mm -hmm. And the Neuro Dojo is just like a cool program that we offer that allows me to go deeper into a lot of the philosophies that we share like in our membership. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's a really fun experience because I'm able to teach a lot of the brain-based fitness things that I like. So we get to nerd out and uh, we just finished up the sales process for that. And we've got an awesome group that's enrolled. Man, that's amazing. And so when you say there's a group, are they all going through this process together as a cohort? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the way that we run it is we basically meet weekly for calls, like virtual calls. And I have like uh, education that I provide them through, you know, theory. And then we get into some application and the group goes through it together. We do like brain-based assessments so they can learn something about their health and their performance through these really unique assessments. And then I'll even do some assessing for them on my end. Like, so for today, I was actually, before we got on this call, I was looking at people's gait. So the members were, were sending me videos of their walking gait. And I was reviewing their gait process and then writing down notes about what I see because with gait, whatever, you know, the, the way that their body is moving tells me stuff. Yeah. And then I relay that back to them. And then they compare that to the findings that they're getting in the assessments that I'm teaching them on the calls mm -hmm. with the goal being to figure out where are the underperforming systems for the person. And then as the program goes on, they learn how to train those underperforming systems. That's cool. So you're, you're providing feedback, but also teaching people to kind of figure it out on their own as they go, right? Exactly. Exactly. And this is actually, so we've run this program, you know, a few times in the past. And this is the first time that we're going deeper into that because we want it to be a discovery process for the person. And, and people get really excited about that. They get excited about like learning how to assess their health and their function and then taking that information and figuring out like what can they do about it using exercise as a delivery system to improve whatever is underperforming in relation to their brain and their body. Yeah. And, and with an emphasis on like the neuro side of it, correct? Definitely. So it's a huge emphasis on the neuro side of it, but we also connect it to like traditional fitness too. So it's like, it's very blended, but we'll do some things that we don't traditionally offer in like our membership with workouts and stuff because mm -hmm. it's just going deeper. So mm -hmm. like vision exercises, literally exercising your eyes, vestibular exercises for balance, things like that. And then we'll also make some connections into the kinds of things they can do with their general fitness that actually coincide with the assessments that they're learning and doing on themselves in the program. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And um, I'm glad people are signing up. It sounds super useful. You know, today I really wanted to talk about how you got to where you are in terms of being able to thread the needle between the fitness stuff, the neuroscience, not only being able to implement it, but being able to teach it to others. I imagine that this didn't happen overnight. Right. It did not. So in your own mind, where does your journey to this point begin? Well, it begins with probably when I first started becoming interested in fitness and performance. So back in high school, we, you know, when I started training because I made the connection early on that 
if I wanted to be better at the sports that I was doing, I could actually train for that. And that's kind of where the journey started for me. And that was, you know, that training back then consisted of, you know, traditional strength training and things of that nature. So you were a strength athlete, like powerlifting, that kind of thing? Yeah. So it's funny because initially I would, I would call myself a powerlifter, although not competitively. I was basically training like a powerlifter. Mm-hmm. And there was actually a little bit of like crossover into like what I would look at now as like bodybuilding. Okay. So like back then I was still, you know, of course learning and I didn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily know how to make my training in the gym as athletic as it could have been. So I was really working towards a lot of strength training and lifting heavy weights and that kind of thing. Awesome. How did you know what to do when you went into the gym or what, what was your first experience with that? Well, my first experience with lifting weights is funny because I think looking back at it, it really started like at maybe 13, 14 years old. My dad went to the local transfer station and came home with a bench press. And I just remember it being this like old beat up bench press. There was, you know, holes on the pad and yeah, rust, you know, on it already and if you remember, it was like the old school weights, right? The plates that go on with the small diameter hole and then yeah, you the like one screw inch. them on. Yeah. And that's really where it all started. And I think that was probably back when I was 14 years old. And so I did what every 14 year old would do if they had weights. I did bicep curls and bench press. And that's yep. about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. So that's really where it all started. And I remember reading like the Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography and like yeah. pulling exercises from the book and dog earing pages and trying to learn about, you know, what I could do with these weights that I had. So that's where it started for me in terms of the weightlifting. And then when I got into high school, I was really fortunate that the wellness department well, first of all, I was fortunate that there was a wellness department because I don't think I don't think all high schools back then even had that. But the wellness department was great, and I was exposed to really great teachers and coaches. And we actually had classes in high school that taught you how to use the gym. And I think that was a really rare thing, too, especially back then. I remember we had a class called Personal Fitness. Mm-hmm. And you would go into the gym and learn how to use the machines. And then there was like a, another class after that, that then taught you how to use free weights. And so early on, I had good exposure to that stuff. And then the coaches that I had, because I played lacrosse and I wrestled, the coaches that I had were really great resources too. So I learned a lot early on and that's kind of where it all, where it all started. Yeah, where it all began. Yeah. And and when you say you played uh, lacrosse and you wrestled, was that competitively? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Lacrosse was probably the first sport that I really fell in love with. And then I played lacrosse, you know, before high school. And then when I got to high school, I played up until my junior year. Yeah, I played through my junior year. And then I discovered wrestling as a junior. That's when I started wrestling. and. It was very surprising because I ended up loving wrestling so much that it started, you know, being competition for my lacrosse. Mm, yeah. And I, in most of my time, started going into wrestling. And then I decided that I wasn't going to play lacrosse my senior year in high school. I was going to shift my focus to wrestling because my coach at the time was like, you know, if you really put your mind to it and you really focus, you could probably wrestle in college. And I was shocked by that because I started wrestling very late in the game as a junior in high school. Yeah. But I listened to him and I decided to focus on wrestling and I did a lot of off season wrestling. So I ended up, I ended up not playing lacrosse my senior year and focusing so much on wrestling. And that ended up being the right thing to do because then I did get to wrestle in college. Oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. So was it like a scholarship situation or no, was it was a, no, it was a D. So I guess technically you could say I was recruited because 
I, you know, I talked to a coach found me. Mm-hmm. We had a dual meet one day with a New Hampshire team. And I ended up um, wrestling against at that time who a guy who was a state champion for New Hampshire. And I wrestled him and I beat him. And the coach that was there to potentially recruit him ended up talking to me as well. Yeah, well. <laughs> and that was kind of like my opportunity and then started talking with this coach. And one thing led to another. And I ended up wrestling at a small D3 school, which for me was awesome. Because again, you know, starting wrestling as a junior in high school is like, it's very late in the game. Mm-hmm. So I got to have that experience. And funny enough, the guy that I beat, he came too. So the two of us ended up on the same team for a couple of years and he ended up, uh, he ended up leaving, but yeah, that's how, that's how that went. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So throughout that time as a high school student, as a college student, strength training, wrestling, some lacrosse, were you actively studying beyond just being an athlete yeah, I, I think I think you could say I was. I it was so back then it was more difficult to find those resources. So you might you'd pick up books, you'd pick up even magazines. But for me it was more about meeting people, meeting people who already had good information. Mm-hmm. And so meeting coaches. I remember in high school I had a couple of really good coaches that stood out to me that also were good resources for me for strength training. And, and we actually had an athletic trainer in high school who was a phenomenal resource for powerlifting and Olympic lifts. And so I had good exposure to that stuff early on. Same thing in college. I had some coaches that I was able to get good information from, but then when I really think about it, I met at, you know, who's to this day still one of my mentors and one of my best friends I met a guy who was teaching a class called the Burdenko Method in college. His name's Tom. And he became like my number one resource because what he was teaching, the system, this thing called Burdenko Method, was so unique. And I was really drawn to it and attracted to how dynamic it was and how it focused on so many other athletic qualities besides just strength. And so that kind of, yeah, that kind of became like the moment for me. And this happened early on in college that started getting me to think outside the box. Can you give like an example of of something in the Burdenko method that's yeah. outside the box that drew you in? Sure. So the system itself is really unique in the fact that it's a, it uses a combination of land-based exercises and also water exercises. So literally, not swimming, because that's what people think of at first, but literally exercises done in either the shallow end of a pool, or a lot of them are done in the deep end of the pool, and you wear special flotation around your waist, and there's different like tools and stuff that create resistance in the water, and you can exercise in the water. And it's an amazing medium for recovery. So Mm -hmm. Tom introduced me to the Burdenko method and the thing that stood out to me the most about it was that there was actually a part of it that was dedicated to feeling better and recovering. And the water could be used to help with pain management as well. So as the guy with chronic elbow pain, I was Mm -hmm. really intrigued by the idea that Tom was telling me, hey, you got to train hard. And you have to hit all six essential qualities of, you know, of fitness, which he passionately taught, but you also have to spend as much time with your recovery. And for me, that was a really big turning point because again, I had pain. And when I went into the pool and I did the exercises that he was teaching me, I felt better. Mm -hmm. So it was like the first thing that I had in my toolbox that allowed me to feel better and do more as an athlete as a result of that. Wow, so like a light bulb moment. Yeah. When did your elbow pain start? That started back in high school. And I think, you know, as a high schooler, being so focused on how much weight I could put on the bar 
and not understanding that it wasn't necessary to do a max bench press every other week. (laughs) I think it was my training habits and not having balanced training habits that probably was the beginning of my elbow pain. Yeah. So just like um, doing too much of one type of exercise or lifting too heavy or absolutely, that kind of thing. yeah, both of those things. Yeah, and and with the Berdanko method, did that solve those problems for you? It did not. So that's interesting that you asked that. It it gave me a way to manage it, and. In addition to that, it also made me a better athlete because it was a much more well-rounded system that was focusing on things like balance and coordination and flexibility, not just, say, speed and strength. Mm -hmm. So it did not fix my elbow pain, but like I said, it gave me a tool. It gave me my first tool, a thing that I could do when I knew that I needed it. And it would help me feel better and move better. So I looked at it as kind of like a management tool for Mm -hmm. the pain that I was experiencing. How bad was it, the pain? You know, it was, it it fluctuated like crazy. So sometimes I would feel pretty healthy and I really wouldn't have elbow pain. And then as training volume would increase, And we did a lot of live wrestling. Live wrestling means, you know, you're all in. It's live situation, you know, live situation and you're going 100%. The more of that that we did throughout the practice weeks, usually the worse it got. Mm -hmm. And what would happen to me is I would have a very frustrating wrestling season where the pain would fluctuate and I might feel good at the beginning of the week, really good, wrestling well. Then all of a sudden, by the end of the week and Saturday rolls around, now it's time to compete. And then by the time we get there, now I'm not feeling good. Oh, you're showing up all beat up already. That's right. And and that was the frustrating cycle that I had through um, high school and college. And actually what would happen to me is summer would roll around and I would be able to control my training volume quite a bit and I wouldn't do quite as much live wrestling. And I would feel really, really good during the summer break. And I would be very, very strong. And I would go to off-season tournaments and I would do very well because I didn't have that training volume. Then, you know, I get all excited, go back to the in-season with um, in college or in high school. And then the cycle would start again of the training volume building and the pain becoming worse. And so some days, like I said, I would feel okay. And then other days I remember like, not being able to grip things well. And every time I made contact with, you know, my opponent and there's a lot, a lot of what's called hand fighting and gripping, Mm -hmm. I would be very, um, weak. I wouldn't have a strong grip and there'd be pain. And so, yeah, it was a frustrating cycle. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. It's, it's really interesting that when your training was up to you over the summer, you intuitively did less and felt better and performed better. Exactly. And that was not something that you had read about or learned about. That was just, it just felt good. That was feel. That was feel. And it's now that you're saying that, I'm I'm thinking about that. And I'm like, yeah, that's early on. I think I had no choice but to learn how to pay attention to my body. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I had to constantly monitor the, the cues that my body was sending me. And I had to make decisions based on that. So I actually became very in tune early on. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think that's what ended up making me a good coach. Because I coached wrestling too. I coached high school wrestling. Yeah. And I was a better, a much better coach than I was an athlete. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I ended up enjoying it more too. But I think that my experience in kind of getting in tune with my body and understanding that, you know, it wasn't, it it wasn't necessary to always train as hard as you possibly could. There had to be sort of waves of that, but then you had to back off, deload, let your body recover, kind of figured out that stuff pretty early on because I was listening to my own body. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so at some point you transitioned from being the athlete to being the coach. Was was coaching wrestling your first experience as a coach, as an authority on these subjects? Yeah, it was. You know, I did coach a lot of youth aged athletes before mm -hmm. that in terms of just conditioning and fitness. So I did do that. But in as far as like organized sport, coaching high school wrestling was definitely my first experience with that. Let's go back to uh Berdanko. This method that you were taught in college kind of uh set off some light bulbs for you. Yeah. But it didn't quite seal the deal. It didn't quite solve all the problems that you wanted to solve with your own pain, right? Exactly. So where did you go from there? What was next for you? Well, I got out of college and Tom, the mentor that I mentioned, he actually introduced me to Igor Berdanko, the innovator of the Berdanko method. Wow. And yeah, because I had, I had basically went through the certification process at that point to become, I think, like a level two I get my I think I got my level 2 certification in the Berdanko method by the time I graduated college and the next step was to become master certified and Tom ended up introducing me to Igor and got me a gig basically with Igor who at the time was working pretty you know it was local it was in Massachusetts and I got a job down in uh, Massachusetts with Igor, and I basically followed him around as his right hand man for a while wow, and got to experience. So cool. Yeah, it was awesome. Got to experience what he did. And Igor at the time, I mean, he's a world famous uh, name in the industry for a couple of different reasons, primarily some of the athletes that he helped rehab. In fact, he rehabbed. If you remember um, Nancy Kerrigan, the figure skater, yeah, when she yeah when she had her knee blown out, that whole thing. Yikes! That he whole thing. yeah he rehabbed her, among amongst other big names. Um, so it was a cool experience, and uh, I got to follow Igor around and learn from him, and and that was my first gig as a coach or a personal trainer mm -hmm. out of college. Yeah. And at this point, did you kind of have the bug? Is this something that you wanted to pursue yeah, professionally? It was. Yeah. yeah, I had the bug. I went all in. I started really just learning, absorbing everything that I could, still from Tom and now from Igor and some of the other colleagues that I had where we were working. And it was awesome. I learned so much. But like you were saying, I still hadn't resolved my own issues. So even though I was learning this amazing system that was definitely teaching me great things to share with athletes and clients, I still wasn't solving my own chronic pain. I was just managing it. So the continued education journey continued, and I still stayed really dedicated to the Burdanko method. There was still a lot to learn, but I started exploring other modalities other philosophies. And through frustration, and I say frustration because all my clients, and remember I'm a new, at this point, I'm a new personal trainer at a college. All my clients have pain. They're all showing up with pain. Mm. And I was put in a position where I felt uncomfortable because I didn't always want to work around people's problems. I wanted to at least have some form of solution for them. Yeah. And I didn't. I didn't really have those tools because I didn't have a way to assess people. I didn't have a way to understand what was happening with their, why did they have the movement problems or the pain that they were experiencing? So it was frustrating because I ended up needing to work around people's problems constantly. And my job as a personal trainer ended up becoming more about becoming a creative coach so that you could essentially entertain your client enough with good fitness mm -hmm. while avoiding the actual problems. 
And I still think there is a place for that as a coach, because sometimes you have to do that and that's an okay thing to do. Mm -hmm. But for me and where I was headed and where I wanted to be, I knew that I had to learn more. And so I continued with lots of different forms of continued education and lots of just testing things out and honestly not being satisfied in the results for myself and for my clients. And eventually that led me to something called Z Health. And Z Health is a continued education company that teaches how to blend concepts from neuroscience with movement. Mm -hmm. And it is where I learned about pain. It's where I learned how to assess people's brain and nervous system. And it is the thing that allowed me to finally get results both for myself and for my clients. How did you hear about it? So at the time, I had a personal training studio with my wife, Alicia, and this was in Massachusetts. And when we first opened our studio, I want to say this is back in maybe 2014-ish, when we first opened our studio, at the same time, there was a chiropractic office opening below us. And so we became friendly with them. And one of the chiropractors had mentioned to me, hey, I, I've been reading about some of the stuff that you're teaching. And mm-hmm. he was referring to the Burdenko method. And we also did something else at that point. Um, it was more of a manual stretching technique. He's like, I've been reading about some of that stuff that you do, and you you seem to be into a lot of this, these interesting things. Have you ever heard about Z Health? And he started telling me because he had been through the Z Health curriculum, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I think you should check this out. And he gave us a coupon to check out one of their introductory courses. You know, it was like, Something like here, two, you know, save two hundred bucks and check right. out this course. And they, they just yeah. happened to be in Boston. Okay. So we went. And interestingly enough, I'm I'm recalling now that the first time he told me about it, we kind of blew it off. Yeah. And and then the second time he told me about it, they came to Boston and we were like, okay, let's go check it out. So both uh, Alicia and I went, and we were mind blown. It was awesome. Wow, interesting. Can you share something that like really stood out to you? Like what was it that that blew well, your mind? Yeah, so first, what blew my mind was how they were actually validating what I had learned through the Burdenko method. Because with the Burdenko method, there wasn't a lot of science. It was more just, okay, here's the exercises mm-hmm. and that's it. It was more of like a, a, a book of exercises and there wasn't a ton to go with it in terms of why are we doing these things. And that mm-hmm. always left a lot of questions in my mind. So when I started the Z Health education and we hit up that first course, they started talking to us about, for example, how important it is to practice exercises at varied speeds. And one of the fundamental principles in the Burdenko method is everything that you do should be practiced at a slow, a medium, and a fast speed. Mm -hmm. But there was no explanation for why. So I always had questions about that. Well, with Z Health, they broke it down in terms of what each speed was doing for your brain and what nerve receptors were activated and why those things were important and how all of this neurology actually comes into why you would want to train at those three different speeds. So already I was blown away because I was like, there's science here. Now I can validate the training decisions that I'm making for myself and my clients. So from there on that kept happening. And then of course I started learning stuff I had never even known about pain neuroscience and assessments to understand, you know, what parts of your brain are underperforming. And it's, uh, it was really a great experience. Yeah. It's something that I think it's not very intuitive that what you're doing with your body 
and like we all know this intellectually, but intuitively what you're doing with your body is connected to what's going on in your brain, right? That's right. Like if you have pain in your calf, you're not thinking about your brain. You're thinking about your calf. That's right. right? Yeah. So you're starting to learn all this stuff. And I'm assuming, are you incorporating this as you go with your, your personal training? I am. Yeah, I am. In fact, I, I jumped in immediately and started applying the concepts. How did that go? It was good. You know, I never, I've never been one to be nervous to do that. I just take it and I apply it and I start to see what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty amazing because we were learning this. Some of the first things that we learned were basic, what we call joint mobilizations. And what that means is that you learn how to move a joint your wrist, your elbow, knee, hip, whatever it may be, you learn how to move it through a full range of motion. And it sounds fundamental, but most people don't do it. And we're learning how to do this in a way that was really powerful because you're activating certain areas of the brain, you're facilitating muscles that were, you know, being, you know, lazy if you want to look at it that way. So many good things come from this. And I started taking that information in practice and applying that on a daily basis with clients and started getting a lot of really good results right away. Didn't even necessarily know what was happening, but I was really excited that they were already better results than I was previously getting. Yeah. And when you say results, are we talking like people are lifting more weight? Are we talking people are in less pain? Are we talking about people are in more mobile? Like what is this really working on? Yeah. So it can work on any of those things that you just mentioned for sure. Most people find me that even back then and now they find me because they have some kind of movement problem or pain. Mm -hmm. So at the time I was using these tools to help people with movement issues and pain issues. We we're seeing immediate improvements in people feeling less pain, immediate improvements in their mobility restrictions, that kind of thing. And how about your pain, your chronic pain? So I was getting a great result from it too. I wouldn't say, I would say that the baseline part of the curriculum, as I started to move through it, solved maybe 60 to 70% of my issues. But my, for example, my elbows still weren't 100% back. And I ended up resolving my elbow pain using the lens of Z Health and the tools that they offered and the education. But it wasn't until later, as I worked through the core curriculum and beyond, and let me just mention that this is years. So their mm -hmm. curriculum is very deep. And so the core curriculum is, it's either three or four classes. And after that, there's like, I think, nine classes after that. And literally, we worked through this in a number of years. And at one point, I went to one of their courses. I remember because I flew to California to go. And in fact, at the time, my wife and I were so into Z Health, and we were doing so much with it. She had a course that she had not been to yet, but I had already been to it. And she went to that course, which was held in New York. And so on the same weekend, I went to California and she went to New York, both for wow. Z Health, but for different classes. So we were like all in. <laughs> and a couple that Z Healths together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so and so I went to a course called T Phase. And T Phase is one of their courses that teaches you a lot of really great tools for dealing with pain. And I had also just recently started getting into jujitsu. Mm. And so I was starting to feel some of that elbow pain creep back, which made me really nervous. Well, I was at this course, we were learning these exercises that are part of a category called neuromechanics. And what that is, is essentially mobility work for your nerves. And hmm. I learned uh, an exercise 
to mobilize what's called my radial nerve. So this is a, an upper body nerve. It's in, it's in the arm. And with a neuromechanic, you position your limb into a very specific position that is for tensioning a nerve. And then once the nerve is under gentle tension, you move a joint that the nerve crosses, and that basically mobilizes the nerve. So I did this for my radial nerve, and instantly I felt the little bit of tenderness and pain that I had in my elbow vanish. And I was like, wow, and I'm reassessing my movement, and I can't believe how a single exercise made that happen. And so by then taking that drill and some other things and practicing them consistently, I was able to resolve my elbow pain in a very short amount of time. It was awesome. Man, that's crazy. Like when I think of nerve pain, you know, one thing I think about is like carpal tunnel or something. Right. And again, I'm a lay person for anyone that's curious. I'm not an expert in any of these things, but I am a fitness enthusiast. And anyway, so I've dealt with some some wrist pain myself. And I think about it as it feels like it's inflamed and it's like catching on something or rubbing against something when it's in the wrong position. Hmm. So the idea that I could just move my arm in a certain way using neuromechanics to relieve that is mind boggling. Yeah. Is it adjusting how the nerve sits? So it's, you can look at it a number of different ways. So clinically and traditionally, these neuromechanic drills are generally used to help people with entrapment issues. And like what you just mentioned as like a carpal tunnel kind of thing, that could be considered an entrapment issue mm -hmm. or a pressure put on a nerve. And so technically, yes, you could move the nerve in a way that fixed the entrapment and freed the nerve, so to speak. So that is one way to use them. And that's probably the most common. Yeah. But the cool thing about these exercises is there's so many different reasons why you would use it. You don't have to have a nerve problem to get benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do the nerve mobilization drills just because mobilizing your nerves is a healthy thing to do. Mobilizing your joints and your muscles is a healthy thing to do. Bringing a nerve to its end range of motion just like when you do that with joints or muscles, is a healthy thing to do. So yes, the nerve could be freed, so to speak, but also stimulating it just through the act of the mobilization can affect your brain and your body in a number of different ways. Yeah, it feels like a frontier that mainstream fitness just hasn't quite gotten to yet, right? Like we talked about joints and, and ligaments a lot. I think a lot of people are hip to that. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. It is definitely becoming more popular now, but it's still uh, most people still haven't experienced it at this point. And actually, I share so many of the neuromechanic drills on Instagram mm -hmm. because they're so powerful for people. And I get messages like every single day, somebody is messaging me saying, Thank you so much. I cannot believe this, but I tried that, you know, whatever nerve glide that you posted and I've been struggling with shoulder pain for 10 years and nothing has ever helped me. And I did one set of your nerve glide and the pain is gone. And that is like a almost daily experience in my DMs from people who are trying those drills. Wow. Yeah. And so I keep posting them because they are so powerful and they've helped so many people. So it you know, at this point, you're you're still an athlete. You're still training jujitsu, but you are primarily a. How would you? What would you consider your title? Are you a coach? Are you a trainer? Yeah. So I usually just say I'm a coach and a personal trainer. Okay. However, so much of what I'm doing now is being an educator. Mm. So I'm kind of wearing multiple hats. I do so much education with our members. But I still do work with clients one-on-one. -on -one. I still do some of that work. And so I usually just say coach, educator, personal trainer. <laughs> <laughs> you give the spiel yeah. that you just yeah. gave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Nice. So as a, as a coach, personal trainer, and educator, 
it seems like you've put together, you know, some things that you've learned from Berdanko, some things that you've learned from Sea Health, some things that you learned intuitively as an athlete. What are some of the things that you're working on now that you would like to improve or you would like to, or what are some nuts that you haven't yet cracked? Okay. So as a coach, the most difficult client for me to help is there's two of them. There's two of them. The most difficult clients for me to help are the ones that have behavior change issues. And I think that that's really common in whether you're looking at fitness or nutrition or right, just creating new habits to, you know, enact the things that need to happen in a person's life to, you know, help them achieve their goals. Creating new habits is difficult. And so when a person has a certain level of behavior change struggle, they become a very difficult person to help, even if your tools are awesome, because right. they can't get anywhere if they don't use the tools. Right. So in, from a coaching perspective, I have now kind of circled back to trying to learn more about how to support a person in the behavior change aspect of what I do. Yeah. Because I already know the tools are amazing, but if I can't get you to use them with enough frequency, then it's hard to help you. So this is something that I feel like I've circled back on a lot in the last couple of years. And I, I've kind of put the brakes on a little bit in terms of going deeper and deeper and deeper into neuroscience, which is, you know, a passion for me. Mm -hmm. Because if I keep going deeper, I might you know, I'm going to collect more and more information and tools, but people need to be able to use those things. So for me, I've been spending time trying to learn, you know, how to support those people. And then the other client that is difficult for me to help that challenges me is the one with some kind of fuel capacity issue. And what that means is that for whatever reason, they have maybe an energy production problem that they may not even be aware of. This is, you know, could be a completely unconscious thing at, you know, a cellular level we're talking, not necessarily someone who says, hey, I'm, I feel tired during the day and I don't want to. I mean, sure, that's part of it. You can hear that. But the person with some level of fuel capacity problem is a very challenging client to help. The reason being is that their brain and body is very stubborn to change because they don't have the necessary fuel resources to make those changes. So when it comes to like helping a person move better, helping them reduce the pain that they feel, there are so many neurological changes that have to occur for that to happen. If your brain calculates that it doesn't have the energy resources to make those changes, it simply won't. And so then you see clients that are trying lots of different things, but they're also the person saying nothing helps or something helps for a short amount of time, but now that same thing doesn't help anymore. They're the person that's constantly, I, I often, um, when I talk about this to our members, I'll say you're playing whack-a-mole with your pain mm. or just like you're constantly putting out your fires because you find something that helps. It supports you for a little bit, but then it no longer helps you. Yeah, Those are telltale signs that there's some kind of fuel capacity issue. So a lot of my uh, learning right now has been going into that as well so that I can just better help our members. Yeah. Again, you know, I'm not first in, in neurochemistry. So when you say like fuel, would it be something along the lines of like a neurotransmitter like dopamine or serotonin or like it's just doesn't it's not producing enough of something like that? In the yeah, brain? Yeah, it certainly could. And I'm sure like the science of that could go very, very deep. For me, it's uh, it's a little bit more um, it's a little bit more superficial than that. Basically, what I'm saying is the person, so first of all, looking at different ways that a person can get fuel, there's really a few different ones that we're most interested in. So one obviously is gonna come from nutrition. Mm -hmm. So you could have some fuel issues that are coming from, you know, you don't have the proper nutrition to support you. 
there could be fuel issues coming from maybe sleep pattern issues, sleep disturbances, low quality sleep. That's a, that could be a part of it. There could be movement problems that are leading to a fuel capacity issue because movement is one of the ways that we fuel our brain and our body. And a big one happens to be breathing because breathing mm. is like our fastest, most readily available form of fuel. Any person that happens to have a chronic breathing dysfunction of some kind may be experiencing a fuel deficit to some level and they don't know it. And so as a coach, I have to kind of evaluate all these things and figure out maybe where their fuel problems are coming from and then enact a plan to help them with those things. And oftentimes those plans look like changing your nutrition, getting better habits there, working on your sleep, doing the right movement and finding your minimal effective dose of that movement is key. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then also using breathing exercises to help support you, which can be really powerful. What would you say to 13-year-old Taylor getting excited about the weight bench and the bicep curls? What would you say to him knowing what you know now about hmm. all of this? <laughs> well, I know he probably wouldn't listen, <laughs> but... Beh behavioral issues, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, I think I would say, watch out, buddy, with how much you chase weight and put weight on that bar, hmm. because that weight on that bar doesn't necessarily transfer to athletic ability the way that you think it does. And the weight on that bar also shouldn't be connected to your self-worth in any way. Because I think as like a young weightlifter, a lot of my identity was in how much weight I was lifting. And I think that that, that hurt me and those that kind of formed a poor relationship with fitness for me at one point. And I had to eventually get to a point where I could squash all that. Yeah. So yeah, if someone is brand new to the podcast, brand new to cruise elite where's the best place for them to start so we have a free community actually that you can get involved with and i often on instagram will share how you can do that if you follow us on instagram but inside the free community actually i think alicia and i were talking about this um, recently there is like 35 hours of free educational video content at this point inside the free community Wow. It's awesome. And we have programs in there for people to do. We've got low back health and mobility programs, shoulder mobility, hip mobility, knee mobility at this point. So our free community called the Dojo is um, an awesome resource for getting involved with us and starting to learn about our philosophy. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. This has been a great conversation. If our listeners want to learn more, please follow the podcast check out the website and the dojo and come along for the ride. I promise you'll learn valuable lessons and build a tool set that will help keep you training pain-free for years to come. Thanks again for listening.